स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया in the form of an example okay so the example the example is number 3 here so the example i have is that of the lagrangian for the kepler's problem okay so for the kepler's problem my lagrangian is as follows l of t comma q bar comma q bar dot which is m by 2 q1 dot square plus q2 dot square plus k by square root q1 square plus q2 square right okay where where my m is positive and k is a constant right so these are my this is my setup so now i have to i have to set up my uh well let me call this as condition 1 prime so i have to set up my condition 1 prime to find the infinitesimal generators right so in this case so so we have to find find xi comma eta 1 comma eta 2 right my infinitesimal generators for the variational symmetry so again to set up the prolongation operator let us calculate some of these partial derivatives so del l del t note that l is independent of t the independent variable so this is zero and then my generalized momenta pk is del l del qk dot this is also equal to differentiating mqk dot and also my other derivatives partial derivatives del l del qk uh, is the only place where q appears is in this potential energy k divided by square root of this quantity so i get that this is also equal to negative qk times k divided by q1 square plus q2 square to the power 3 by 2 right okay so my prolongation operator in this case pr1 of vl is equal to eta1 del l del q1 plus p1 times eta1 minus xi1 q1 plus uh, p eta2 times del l del q2 this is a 2d problem plus p2 times eta2 dot minus xi dot q2 dot okay so i plug in all these quantities so let me let me plug in all the quantities and write down the expression so after plugging in all the quantities i am going to get the following expression uh, this is quite long eta1 q1 plus eta2 q2 divided by divided by q1 square plus q2 square to the power 3 by 2 plus m times eta1 dot q1 dot minus xi dot q1 dot square uh, plus eta2 dot q2 dot minus xi dot q2 dot square so these are my first set of terms and then plus plus m times terms like negative q1 dot cube xi1 so xi1 is uh, the derivative of xi with respect to q1 right minus the next terms q1 okay minus the next term is q1 q2 dot cube xi2 and again this is the derivative of xi with respect to the variable q2 okay minus q1 dot square q2 dot c xi2 minus q1 dot q2 dot 
square xi1 plus q1 dot square eta 1 1 minus xi t where eta 1 1 is the derivative of eta with respect to q 1 right. So, eta 1 1 is the derivative of eta 1 with respect to q 1 okay. and then this is well the other set of terms is q 2 dot. So, the reason I am writing is for all the students to go home and check that we indeed get all these terms minus xi t. So, again eta 2 comma 2 implies partial eta 2 partial q 2 okay. and then plus q 1 dot q 2 dot of eta 1 comma 2 and the, the notation is obvious plus eta 2 comma 1 uh, plus q 1 dot uh, eta 1 comma t plus q 2 dot eta 2 comma t. Okay. So, I am done with writing all the expressions. There is one more expression that I need to write and that is so, we have right now written what is the prolongation first order prolo prolongation operator for L the Lagrangian and then we also need to check what is L uh, z, xi dot this is also equal to m by 2 uh, well. So, let me write down after multiplication I get the following terms m by 2 q 1 dot cube xi 1 plus q 2 dot cube xi 2 plus q 1 dot square q 2 dot xi 2 and then plus q 1 dot q 2 dot square xi 1 plus q 1 dot square xi t plus q 2 dot square xi t right. Okay. So, k plus k by square root q 1 square plus q 2 square times xi t plus q 1 dot xi 1 plus q 2 dot xi 2. Okay. So, these are all the sets of equations that we are going to get. So, I am going to uh, I am going to term this whole this gigantic expression as a and this as b. So, I have to add a plus b and equate the various powers of q 1 dot and q 2 dot and I am going to get the following relations. So, a plus b set equal to 0 implies uh, let me now go to the next slide. We are going to get the following set of relations by equating various powers of q i dot. The relations I get is eta 1 comma 1 minus xi t by 2 this is 0 and eta 2 comma 2 plus minus xi t by 2 is equal to 0 plus the third uh, set of the third relation is eta 1 comma 2 plus eta 2 comma 1 is equal to 0 and I also get eta 1 comma t is equal to 0 and eta 2 comma t is equal to 0 and finally, the relation q 1 square plus q 2 square of psi t minus eta 1 q 1 plus eta 2 q 2 set equal to 0. So, let me call this as expression A, this as expression B, expression C, D, E and finally, expression F. Okay, so, from so, from A I also let us go back few slides. Notice that in A we have coefficients of the form q we have terms of the form q 1 dot cube q 2 dot cube. Now, all these coefficients the coefficients of these cubic terms they will vanish. So, xi 1 is 0 and xi 2 is 0 right. So, from A we see that coefficients of q 1 dot cube and q 2 dot cube are 0 or what I get is xi 1 is xi 2 is 0 or I get that xi is purely a function of t right and then so it is a purely a function of t. So, then from these two relations 
I also see that uh, eta 1 and eta 2 are independent of uh, of the variable time, right. So, from from d and e, I see that each of these etas are just functions of the respective uh, just functions of the dependent variable q, right. So, let me call this relation as g. Now, from a, b, from the first two relations and g, so from a, b and the relation g, what I get is as following. It turns out, notice that we are equating eta 1 1 is nothing but the derivative of eta 1 with respect to q 1 and xi t will be purely a function of the independent variable t and we are equating these two e together, which means that both of them this quantity and this quantity both of them must be constant. So, which means we conclude that there exists a C 1, uh, there exists a C 1, a constant such that xi t is equal to 2 C 1 and and eta 1 1 is equal to eta 2 2 is equal to C 1. Okay. So, from here we can conclude several things. Well, first of all psi must be a straight line right? Uh, and we can continue, but most important notice this relation. So, from that relation I can immediately get that eta 1 is c 1 q 1 plus g of q 2. If you differentiate with respect to q 1, I get c 1 and eta 2 is c 1 q 2 plus let us say h of q 1. Right. So, then if I were to use another relation, let us say C, this particular relation, I can conclude further. If I were to use, use relation C, I see that del G del Q 2 is equal to plus del H del Q 1. Well, one is a function of Q 2, the other is a function of Q 1, both equated to 0 implies both are constants, implies del G del q 2 is equal to negative del h del q 1 which is equal to c 2 right. So, I get uh, well, so I get the following. So, I can integrate this relation and from here I get that eta 1 is c 1 q 1 plus c 2 q 2. So, this is a straight line with respect to the variables q 1 and q 2 plus c 3 and eta 2 is c 1 q 2 minus c 2 q 1 plus c 4 right. Let me call this. So, this is a straight line. Finally, uh, if I use my condition f, my condition f is I plug in the last relation, I see that c 1 q 1 square plus q 2 square minus c 3 q 1 minus c 4 q 2 is equal to 0. And if I were to equate this, I get that c 1 is equal to c 3 is equal to c 4 is equal to 0. So, this is gone, this is gone and and this is gone as well, right. So, all I get is that eta 1 is c 2 q 2 and eta 2 is minus c 2 q 1, right. And finally, finally, uh, we can also from all these observations, we can also get that xi which was originally we found to be a function of t comes out to be purely a constant. Okay. So, that comes from, uh, well that comes from uh, this, uh, these set of relations that we have been using. So, students should check that. So, what is the conclusion here? Notice that the way the infinitesimal generators are found, this is nothing but the rotational generators, right. So, eta 1 depends on q 2, eta 2 depends on q 1 provided this constant c 1, c 2 is non 0, right. So, the conclusion is we have two parameter family, two parameter family of variational symmetry. So, what have we got is that if now if my c 2 is 0 and c 5 is not 0, if c 2 is 0 and c 5 is not 0, well, I can only get a time, 
a translational symmetry there is no rotation right. So, this is time translation or translation in T. Now, on the other hand if C 2 is not 0 and C 5 is 0 then I have a pure rotational transformation right. So, so, so what have we found that in the Kepler's problem the only variational symmetries are linear combination of rotation and time translation. Okay. So, we end our topic our discussion by concluding that we can continue finding these variational symmetries for functionals containing integrand of higher order derivatives. <coughs> In a similar fashion, so let me write down the result for functionals for functionals containing containing higher derivatives higher derivatives let us say up to nth order for functionals containing higher derivatives let us say up to nth order right. We calculate we calculate higher prolongation we calculate higher prolongation calculate higher prolongation we call this as P r n of V l. Well, it is easier said than done as we increase this n as n becomes larger and larger this becomes quite complicated to find. Okay. So, I am not going to write the general form, but again I will end the discussion by mentioning what is the condition for existence of variational symmetries with in this case existence of variational symmetry is this particular differential equation that needs to be satisfied. The nth order prolongation plus L times xi dot is equal to 0. So, that is along the similar lines for functions of one dependent variable okay. or fu sorry functions with just first order derivatives. Okay. So, that completes our discussion on finding the necessary condition for the extrema of a functional. I am now going to shift my attention to calculate the second variation or to look at the sufficient condition for an extrema for the existence of the extrema. Namely, if the extrema that we found whether it is a maxima or a minima. Okay. So, we start our discussion on the second variation. The second variation. So, so, the idea is why is second variation the topic is important because so far we have looked at the various uh, forms of Euler Lagrange, but Euler Lagrange only provides the necessary condition for the existence of the extrema, it does not provide the sufficient condition. Okay. So, it only provides the necessary condition for the functional <coughs> to have an extremum <coughs> okay and this is this is similar this is similar to my first derivative this is similar to my first derivative or uh, my gradient test gradient test in infinite dimensional space rn and Euler-Lagrange is well it is not a sufficient condition as I just said. So, not a sufficient condition uh, and specially to determine the nature of the extrema that we find. Okay. So, so th well or this statement is equivalent to saying that a vanishing first derivative in the finite dimensional calculus uh, set e Set or the first uh, derivative in the finite dimensional calculus set equal to 0 is not a sufficient condition for the extrema. Okay. So, vanishing first derivative not a sufficient condition uh, f uh, for, for the extrema right uh, in R n. Okay. 
so then we are going to investigate so so which means the moment the euler lagrange does not provide us with the sufficient condition the natural idea is to look for the higher order terms in our uh, uh, variation of the functional so we are going to look at the terms of the order of del square j so the idea is we need to investigate investigate next term next term in the expansion expansion of j of y hat well j of y hat minus j of y right the variation which will be our second variation of the functional right okay so this is my my second variation right okay why what is the what is the importance of uh, the second variation because we will see that uh, finding ex, uh, investigating the second variation will not only provide us with a more refined necessary condition for the existence of extrema it will also provide us with the sufficient condition for specific cases so it provides us with more refined refined necessary condition uh, for local extrema and it also provides me the sufficient condition for y to be uh, to be a local extrema of j right okay <clears throat> so all these statements that i am making for the functional uh, i am just uh, writing down the equivalent statement in the finite dimensional calculus so as if uh, our multivariate calculus is the guiding uh, topic in finding uh, the sign of these or in investigating the second variation so let us now uh, briefly uh, you know touch upon the topics in multivariate calculus related to uh, finding uh, related to the second derivative test uh, so so i'm going to look revisit our concepts in finite dimensional calculus related to the second derivative tests okay so what so we will revisit uh, revisit finite dimensional case finite dimensional case we will revisit finite dimensional case in r2 okay so let us let us consider a function f from omega to r2 which is a smooth let us consider this to be a smooth function and let x be x1 x2 uh, let us say x is the extrema and let us consider let us consider the perturbation in x so the perturbation in x is said to be x bar plus epsilon eta where epsilon is positive and my eta is the perturbation vector eta1 eta2 this is in r r2 right so i can expand my smooth function using taylor series uh, about the point x bar about let us say some known point x bar so using using taylor series i see that f of x bar is equal to f of x bar is equal to f of x hat plus epsilon times eta1 partial f partial x1 this is evaluated at x bar plus eta2 partial f partial x2 evaluated at x bar okay <coughs> plus epsilon square by 2 uh, the the second order terms involve the following derivatives eta1 square del del f2 del 2 f del x1 square plus 2 eta1 eta2 del 2 f del x1 del x2 plus eta2 square partial 2 partial f del x2 del x2 square okay so these are all my terms in the second uh, for the second derivatives all order epsilon square terms plus order epsilon cube terms right which we ignore so then so suppose so let me write down this 
this uh, expansion in a shorthand notation assuming that x bar x bar is an extrema okay so what we are assuming is suppose f is stationary or it has an extrema at the point x bar right so then it means that the gradient of f evaluated at x bar will be zero or my linear term or order epsilon epsilon term in my taylor series is set equal to zero right can we set equal to zero uh, because this is nothing but uh, the inner product of eta with grad f right when grad f is zero this term will be zero so so in that case my f of x bar hat the perturbed value comes out to be f of x bar plus the order epsilon square terms order epsilon square by 2 q of eta plus order epsilon cube term where my function q of eta is the following quantity q of eta is equal to eta 1 square del 2 f x bar del x 1 square plus plus 2 eta 1 eta 2 del 2 f x bar del x 1 x 2 plus eta 2 square del 2 f x bar del x 2 square. Okay. So, what have we got here? So, we see that for epsilon small the nature of the extrema will be completely determined by the sign of this function q eta. Right? So, what I said is for epsilon small the nature the nature of the stationary point the nature of the stationary point uh, let us say max or min uh, will be completely determined the uh, students should note that we are in in this finite dimensional calculus whatever results we are saying we are saying it without proof because the assumption is the students who are taking this course they have a background in vector calculus so they are requested to refer standard textbooks and we will see that all these results we state in vector calculus will have almost a parallel in functional calculus okay so this is the max is max or min is determined by the sign by the lowest by the lowest order <coughs> non zero by the lowest order non zero derivative right at at x bar okay so lowest that is that is the sign the sign of q of eta right okay okay so so it is all about finding the sign of q and how does it change now it turns out since q is a function uh, it's a continuous function of eta we need to check where the q sign the sign of q changes uh, well so if q since q is a function which is a continuous function of uh, this vector eta and q changes sign which means that there will be a value of uh, of this function eta where q of eta is zero right so those are the points that we need to evaluate so what i said is since q is a continuous function of eta and q changes sign right q changes sign it implies that there exists a value or there exists a function eta which is not zero such that uh, so this is a function of a vector such that q of eta is zero right which means that so this is our q so our q is this so let it let us set it equal to zero or let uh, let me write it in another form so so which means 
which means there exists a real solution for notice that uh, this expression q of eta is quadratic in eta 1 as well as eta 2. So, the so there exists a real solution for 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 the expression eta 1 by eta 2 square del f del 2 f by del x 1 2 plus 2 eta 1 by eta 2 times del 2 f by del x 1 del x 2 plus del 2 f del x 2 uh, the second derivative with respect to x 2 set equal to 0. So, this is a quadratic equation for the unknown eta 1 by eta 2 right. So, which means uh, then we have to worry about the discriminant and see how the discriminant changes sign from here. So, standard arguments in quadratic equation. So, which means we have to. So, the nature of the solution given by eta 1 eta 2 is determined is determined by the nature of the solution is determined by this uh, discriminant which is del f del x 1 del 2 f del x 2 minus del 2 f del x 1 del x 2 right this is set equal to whole square. I call this delta to be my discriminant right this is the standard uh, quadratic equation solution theory. So, the theory says again we are just recalling if my discriminant is negative uh, we are in trouble we will not have a real solution and and further uh, one of the derivatives are non-zero further either del the second derivative of f with respect to x 1 is non-zero or uh, partial 2 partial x 2 is non-zero right at at x bar. So, I see that this is a case where q will be q is indefinite we would not get a real solution for eta 1 eta 2 and the conclusion in the terms of the extremum is that in this situation x bar cannot be an extremum cannot be an uh, extremum since 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 the difference of f of x hat minus f of x depends on the choice of eta right depends on the choice of the function eta ok. So, in this case my x my x is also known as the saddle point ok ok. So, then uh, the case that we are after is when the discriminant is positive. So, uh, so which means that if the discriminant is positive we will have uh, Uh, we we expect that there will be no real solution to the quadratic uh, equation. So, it is the other way yeah. So, if the discriminant is positive we expect that there is no real solution. So, there is no real solution to the quadratic equation right quadratic equation given by q of eta equal to 0 and in that case uh, and so, so which means the following which means that q cannot change signs cannot change signs and uh, in other words I say that q is definite and let us say so and the conclusion from here is that x is a local extremum x is a local extremum and further we can conclude few more results from this that this local extremum is maximum if uh, one of the derivatives second derivatives of f with respect to 
either x1 or x2 are negative and it is a local minimum if, if those derivatives are positive, right. 